Sound levels. Are they okay? Yeah. Excellent. Could be a bit louder actually. A bit louder? Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah? Well, Zoe, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and Charlotte as well. Uh, I'm going to start with a poem because it's very apposite given that Kate Granger sadly passed away and I did a lot of work with Kate Granger and I know a tribute has been made to her uh, yesterday. Kate Granger worked with me at the University of Leeds School of Medicine and one of the projects that I was engaged in there was bringing the voices of the patient out through arts and humanities. And I wrote this poem, and Kate loved it so much that she took time out of her busy schedule to come and make a film with me, which you can find on social media. But I'm gonna read it to you today. It's called Voices of a Patient, and it goes like this. I speak with a patient voice, with a voice of care, that knows the worth of a good life, abides in warm hearts that offer hot brews with warm smiles, that lives with the struggle shared with those who know without confession that knows the worth of a good life, can't buy the hand that holds, nor the time that gives, while pain has its norm. That opens keen minds to hear those things one can only witness. That knows the worth of a good life, unveils to young hearts the human face puts flesh on the bones, reveals a being, not a condition. So that meant a lot for Kate, and it also meant a lot for the patient care community at the school at Leeds, because rarely do we as patients and carers actually get to be viewed as human beings. That's the impression. Sorry to say that. More often than not, we are viewed as conditions. Sometimes interesting, sometimes difficult, sometimes you're given the impression that you'd be more interesting as a living cadaver than actually as a real human being. I'm kind of being a little bit extreme there because there's also a lot of super patient experience and a lot of super care going on as well. Often at the very face-to-face -face of patient, carer, doctor, nurse, therapist interface. Because as I was talking to earlier with Charlotte, where does health take place? Happens here happens at the bedside, happens in the consulting room, happens eye to eye. That's where health takes place. And my experience of health is the only feedback you can really value because it's my experience of healthcare that ultimately you guys are about. So whether you are a senior director in NHS England, or you are a porter. It was good to see a porter get the Cape Ranger Award for Compassion. And I can certainly vouch for that in my patient journey, that porters are absolutely outstanding, caring people. It doesn't matter where you are in that role of health. Ultimately, it's about me. Well, it's not just about me, it's about all patients and it's about all carers. It's about all families that are involved in the healthcare journey. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. 
I can understand that because I worked for 20 years in the public sector and led teams and managed teams and I know all the barriers and the challenges that go with that that means that you can begin to lose sight of what it is you're actually doing. And one of the ways that you can be reminded of that is by actually having conversations, genuine, real conversations with the people for whom you provide the service for. That was something that social care got better at. So in my work, the children and young people that we worked with were involved in every decision-making process of that particular unit that I worked in. That was very scary at first for the staff, but within a very short period of time, we recognized that we were missing the key voice that enabled us to know what was really happening and what would make a difference. It kind of seems that patient carer voices meaningful patient carer voices in decision making in health are somewhat absent or somewhat piecemeal. Yeah? A focus group isn't good enough. A consultation isn't good enough. We need to be in the room having discussions because actually we want the same thing that you want. Funnily enough, once we get clinicians and directors and patients and carers in the same room, it takes maybe half an hour to realise that we all want the same thing. We want the best health care that we can possibly have. And we also recognise the challenges that health care in the 21st century in the UK faces. In particular, budget restraints and budget cuts and resource restraints. We know about this stuff. Patients who are in hospital know about this stuff. They help healthcare professionals do their job because they know that that nurse is under pressure. They know that that doctor is under pressure. It's called vicarious care and it happens out of the sight of healthcare professionals and it happens out of the sight of senior directors. You don't see it happening, but it's happening all the time. There is a wealth of knowledge skills and experience happening right under the noses of healthcare professionals and it's not recognised. Or if it is, it's very tacitly recognised. But it's there. And it's there to be tapped into because if there's one thing I've learned now that I've become a service user in one sense, excuse the jargon, is I want to give back. And every patient carer that I've worked with over the course of 13 years has this strong sense of wanting to give back because we're incredibly appreciative of the health system that tries to support them. Even when that health system makes mistakes, even when that health system becomes obtuse in its communication, the patients are always the ones often wanting to step forward and help address the situation and make change. Unfortunately, we seem to find that certain people retreat. <laughs> I don't know why we're scary. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a scary person, am I? But for some reason, it seems that real, meaningful patient care engagement conversation, dialogue, partnership, it's at the centre of a GMC, uh, requirements for a doctor to work in partnership with patients. Why is that scary? I don't know why it's that scary. I don't know why that is such a big barrier. And until we actually get everyone in the same room talking about this, we're not going to find out. I'm going to do another poem now, because that was my little soapbox thing. This is a poem, it's a bit of a long form poem, so excuse me, but it's a bit of a honorific to healthcare. It's about connections and it's about relationships, but perhaps not in the way that you think. It's called Blood. And it goes like this. 
blood is life. I know this because without the blood transfusions I received after a near fatal road accident, I would not have survived without that life-giving, life-saving blood. Blood is life. I know this because blood speaks to us in our everyday expressions. Can't get blood out of a stone. Blood is thicker than water. Blood shed. In cold blood. Makes my blood run cold. Hot blooded. Blood's up. Makes my blood boil. Blue blood. Fresh blood. New blood. Half blood. Runs in the blood. Flesh and blood. Blood brother. Blood lust. Blood thirsty. Blood letting. Bloody hell. Blood is life. I know this because when we say blood, we get a sense of carrying, containment and relationship, of kinship and of love. Blood is life. I know this because blood consists of 55% liquid plasma and 45% blood cells are carried around the body within the cardiovascular system. Central to this system is our hearts. Our blood and our hearts go together. One the action for the other. Blood carries our emotions, expresses our sense of self, carries the essence of our nature. Blood is life. I know this because blood carries the life-giving gases of oxygen and carbon dioxide that we interchange with the Earth's biosphere. Blood affirms our relationship with everything and all things. Blood is life. I know this because the protection of the circulation of blood remains the priority of doctors, paramedics and first aiders. To save a life means the same today as it did before the advent of human blood transfusions in the 19th century. To stem the flow of blood when a vessel is cut or ruptured remains the key priority in saving life. Blood is life. I know this because to replace the lost blood as a result of trauma or surgery makes all the difference. The surgeons, no matter how skilled, could not have saved my life without the blood transfusions I received during the numerous operations I underwent. Blood is life. I know this because someone, somewhere, saved my life because they gave their blood. Without that gift, I would not live, I would not love, I would not breathe, not have this rebirth, this previous life that I lived. Blood is life. So that's my little homage to healthcare, because I intimately understand what it means to have a life saved, in this case my life. I dread to think how much I've cost healthcare over the course of 14 years because I'm still engaged as a patient with long-term health conditions after that initial life save that took place on 2002 September. So what I'm saying here is how do we begin to find spaces to actually understand this real meaningful sense of what health is about? Because it affects lives. Ultimately, a healthcare professional's experience is based on my experience and them. The one person who doesn't get a choice in that is me as a patient or a carer. It's very difficult to actually change your healthcare professional, be they a doctor or a nurse. It's incredibly difficult. When I rolled into A&E in Scarborough, bleeding to death and expected to be DOA, I couldn't go, excuse me, but I need another crash team. Thank you. I don't you know. I don't like the tie that guy's wearing. You know, uh, I've got no choice. 
Yeah, and most of the time, actually, as patients and carers, we have very little choice. We have to trust who we get and the service 